It's the Bird Emergency, the show where I get to speak to people who are far more expert in the ways of birds than I. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd. And today I am speaking to David Tan, who is doing a PhD on the evolution of pitters. Now, anybody who's into bird photography knows about pitters. Somebody who lives in Australia, like I do, knows about pitters because we've got a couple that people love to go and try and find and photograph. But David is not only going to talk to us about the amazing pitters, David's also really interested in the issue of bird strikes. And David's a native of Singapore, which, like Australia, is on the East Asian Flyway. So there's lots of migratory birds that come down to Australia, down to New Zealand, down to the sub-Antarctic, who use the East Asian Flyway. So we're going to be talking about migratory birds, bird strike, and pitters. Hey, David, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Grant. Halfway across the world. Yes, there we go. I mentioned you're a Singapore native, but you Mm -hmm. are doing your PhD at the University of New Mexico. Just tell us how you got to New Mexico. What made you choose that program instead of studying ornithology in Singapore? To be fair, I did also get a PhD offer from the University of Tasmania, but that was to study seabirds. And if you ask me to choose between seabirds and birds of the forest... It's always going to be the forest for me. New Mexico is sort of part of this sort of the American Southwest, where there's a, a whole bunch of universities with very strong ornithology programs. And the reason why I'm here in New Mexico is because there's a lab here that I'm part of that does a lot of work on island biogeography, which is a topic that's you know, really close to my heart, coming from an island myself, like Singapore. So a lot of the work we do actually touches ver- on, on the bird diversity that's very close to Australia, from the Solomon Islands to Fiji to Samoa. Anywhere in the South Pacific, we're very interested in because these are all natural laboratories of bird evolution. And it's a really exciting part of the world to be looking at, right? And it's really where the theory of island biogeography really originated from Indonesia all the way out into the Solomon Islands. So it's, yeah, that, that's why I'm in New Mexico. A lot of my work focuses on specifically the pittas, which, as you mentioned, a lot of photographers, a lot of bird watchers would doubtless be really familiar with. Some of the most, I think, objectively speaking, the most beautiful birds on earth. I will brook no argument about this. Objectively speaking, they are the most spectacular and wonderful birds on earth. And the surprising thing is we don't really know much about them, right? There have been a few studies from the early 2000s, from the mid 2000s, looking at their evolution. But by and large, the evolution continues to remain a mystery. For example, just last year, my previous supervisor, Frank Ryan, just split out elegant pitta into three different species, right? That, the, the curse of the bird watcher, but also one of the things that list makers love, because then absolutely they, maybe they've got three new or two new species without ever having leave the comfort of their home. That's right. And sorry, can I just get you to explain for a second for those who might be watching who are not evolutionary biologists or not? Wallacea. Tell us about Wallacea. Oh, God, what a part of the world. So Wallacea is the part east of Borneo and then west of Papua New Guinea. So it's this part of the world that's wedged in between two large continents, right? On, on the western side, you have Asia and Borneo and Java and Sumatra and Southeast, and Lola, what we call lowland Southeast Asia. Now, that part of the world was once in a single continent. Even though today, Singapore, Malaysia, Borneo, Sumatra and Java are separate islands, about 10,000 years ago, sea levels were a lot lower than they were today, right? In, in fact, about 115,000 years ago, sea levels were about 120 meters below uh, present day sea levels. And because of that, sea levels dropped. And so all these land masses were merged into a single landmass that was part of Asia, right? And obviously on the eastern side in Australia, you have the Sahel Shelf that separates Australia from Papua New Guinea. And also during this period of time when sea levels were fluctuating like crazy and they were going up and down and up, mostly down really, Papua New Guinea and Aru and all those islands and surrounding that area were once linked to Australia. So if you, if I go from Queensland to Australia, a lot of the birds we're going to see are actually quite similar, <clears throat> right? You have the only Australian species of, of, of bird of paradise up in Queensland. You have cassowaries, you have Australasian robins, the, the Petroika robins as well. So Wallacea, on the other hand, 
right? It's surrounded by all these deep water channels. Wallace's line is one particular channel that separates Asia from Asia. And so because of these deep water channels, not all the birds that originated from Asia or from Australia could make their way onto Wallacea, right? For example, cassowaries don't make their way into Wallacea because cassowaries can't fly. Emus can't fly, so they obviously couldn't make their way into Australia, into Wallacea as well. So Wallacea is a very unusual part of the world, right, where you see the blending of the Australian and the Asian biotas. As you transition from Asia through Wallacea into Australia, you start to realize that woodpeckers become less and less. There are fewer and fewer species of woodpeckers. On the other side, there are fewer and fewer marsupials. And so you see that there is a really interesting sort of natural laboratory of evolution in in Wallacea because of these islands, many of which are quite small, some of which are quite large, like Sulawesi, and a lot of birds are evolving in isolation. And you get this amazing diversity of birds uh, and other organisms, of, of course, right, in the Wallacean islands, including the elegant pitta, which, you know, is a really cool bird. Yeah, <coughs> it's great seeing your passion when you're nerding out. About the, the 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 evolutionary biology of, of the area, what got you interested in the evolution of the families of the birds that that live in the I want to call it the Asian region, but it but but it's technically incorrect, isn't it? When we are talking Australasian, right? The, yeah. the broader realm. I'm from Singapore, so obviously I grew up seeing all these birds around me. I see fantails. Well, whistlers not so much in Singapore. A lot of you you see some species that for some reason, have made it to Asia from Australia, right? Things like the golden-bellied garigony, which is acanthizidae, acanthiz- a canthizidae, it's a weird name, canthizidae, or what, though it's the only representative of that clade, which is primarily Australian, that's in Southeast Asia. Fantails, like willy wagtails that you see in Perth, down at Kings Park, right? The bulk of the radiation is in Wallacea, it's in Australia, but some species make their way into uh, Southeast Asia. Fruit doves, Huge diversity of fruit doves out by your way, and we only get one, two species out in Southeast Asia. So it's a really cool sort of pattern that we observe, right? That not all species are evenly distributed, and you see this geographical structuring of species across space. It's really quite. Can I interrupt you there for a minute? There's something just popped into my head. You're obviously interested a lot in the dispersal and the evolutionary pathways of these families that are so well known in Australia and obviously less so in in the Northern Hemisphere. What is your take on the evolution of birdsong and songbirds? Are are you on board with the theory that it began in Australia and... and, 100%. and So I actually had the privilege of reading Tim Lowe's book, Where Song Began. Tim Lowe, an eminent Australian biologist who wrote this book, about how song began in Australia and spread out across the world. And by and large, the biogeographical evidence seems to point in that direction, that most of the songbird lineages that we see today, the robins and the flycatchers and the crows and the starlings, what have you, must have come out of Australia, right, and then diversified across the whole world. But this is why actually pitters are especially interesting, because pitters are not part of that evolutionary history. Pitters are subossine passerines, they're subossine songbirds, meaning that their closest relatives are things like the broadbills, the tyrant flycatchers of South America. And this means that they must have emerged from Gondwana. Gondwana land in the past would have comprised of bits of Antarctica, large chunks of Australia and New Zealand, bits of South Africa, and bits of South America, right? And so the first wave of songbirds emerging from Gondwana land would have come out of South America and Africa. And that's the radiation that the pitters are part of. It was only after Australia probably broke off from, or Gondwana land started to fragment that this, these sort of the true songbirds, the Ossian passerines started to emerge from Australia out to Southeast Asia, most likely through Asia and then diversified across the world. So I think this is a really cool uh, part of our history that I don't think enough people really appreciate. Australia, to me, is the noisy continent, right? Because it is a really noisy continent. Australians aside, the birds are also really noisy. Uh, and I'm fully on board with this idea, right? And the evidence does seem to hold out as well that really what we know of songbirds suggests that they may have all originated from Australia, that the motherland of song is Australia. 
Well, I'm glad I could get that one in. <laughs> I'm hoping one day to be able to speak to, to Tim Lowe. Yeah, it's a fabulous book. I really enjoyed it. Oh, everyone should read it. Yeah. It's a very well-written book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it set like a controversial idea, and particularly the colonial history of, and I'm talking about the human and sociological history of so many of the communities in Southeast Asia and Australia and New Zealand, kind of meant that the idea that songbirds that had been romanticised in the poetry that we learnt at school and all those historical dramas that we watched on TV and all that as kids, was actually from our whistlers and our wag tails and whatnot and went out. So That's beautiful, awesome. beautiful thing. David, I have to ask you, coming, growing up in Singapore, when did you become a bird nerd and when did you get the bug? Tell us about being a bird nerd in Singapore, which was highly urbanized and we think everyone's going to be a computer nerd game geek or something. Well, the, the sort of the urbanized nature of Singapore actually makes it all the more interesting, right? So I started bird watching when I was, what, 11, 12 years old. It was, I got, I caught the bug fairly early on. Although these days there are the kids starting out bird watching from the ages of what, nine or eight and they terrify me because they're better bird watchers than I am, <laughs> even at that, that wee age. But no, where I started looking at birds was that a bird showed up in school. This was in primary school that looked really weird. And it was building a nest in school, right, in the middle of a city. And it turned out it was a weaver. It was probably a streaked weaver, an Asian golden weaver. It was the first time I'd ever seen something of the sort. And yeah, it's one weird spark bird. A, a friend of mine had also taken up bird watching around the same time. So we decided, you know what, let's just wander around looking for birds. And you start to realize, once you actually start looking, that there's a lot around you. Singapore is very urbanized, but there are still patches of forest. There are still patches of mangrove. But even within the city, because Singapore is within the tropical belt, you do get lots and lots of interesting birds, not just living in the area, but also passing through. And it, it, yeah, it's very similar story for most bird watchers, but coming from a big city, coming from a, a part of the world where Singapore's much more renowned for its urban areas than it is its forests, there it, it 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 is testament to the fact that there is still a lot of biodiversity left behind in whatever forest remnants are left, but also the fact that cities could potentially be very interesting places for nature as well. So David is your bird nerd friend from school still a bird nerd? Very much so, and he's a million times better at bird watching. I am a terrible bird watcher. It's sex blind as a bat, can't remember songs for nuts. Birds are cool. Bird watching is still nonetheless a very enjoyable hobby, and I think you know, that really should be the, the heart and the core of it. Dead set. That's absolutely correct. Now, let's get on to pitters. What's amazing about pitters, and what is the basis of your theme of study for the PhD? Right. So I, I talked pre previously about how pitters are evolutionarily very interesting, right? They are a, a part of this old radiation, this lineage of birds that probably, as far as we know, emerged from Africa. That's why there are still two species of pitter left in Africa, the African pitter and the green-breasted pitter. And it would have followed the broad bills out of Africa and then diversified in this major way in Asia. And the funny thing is one of the, the closest relative to the old world subarsians, so the broadbills and the pitters, is the sapayoa, which is found in South America. How it got there, nobody knows. So the subarsians are, are, are a group that inspires so much joy. Can, let, let me ask you about how you think it went. The, so the pitters and their close relatives were in Gondwana? Gondwana, so, the southern continent. And and so the, the population, the populations of those families were probably dispersed because of the way evolution happens. And that when the continents shifted, you had a couple left in Africa, the bulk of them left in what became Australia and a fringe group stuck on South America. Is that how you see it has happened? Or do you think that they've got back into South America? after the breakup of the continents and the dispersal of these families over m millions of years? It's probably really complex, but we, the evidence we have suggests that Sapayoa may have been a secondary recolonization 
of South America, as we have seen with a whole bunch of other birds as well, right? You have some of these weird families that are primarily New World, but yet you have one or two species in Asia, probably because of long, super long range dispersal. So, for example, the shrike babblers of Asia, the white-bellied apornis, they're actually vireos, and vireos are fundamentally a South American clade. But as far as the evidence seems to suggest, right, as Gondwana and broke off, you had one group of birds that was stuck in South, South America, one group of birds that was stuck in, in South Africa or in, in, in the southern part of the African continent, and then you had the rest of the songbirds going about their merry way in Australia. Right, some of the oldest lineages of songbirds are in Australia and New Zealand, right? The rifle, uh, the rifleman, sorry, the rifleman of, and the, the New Zealand wrens, things like also the, um, the lyrebird of Australia are one of the older sort of lineages of songbirds, right? And so we say a small remnant of these songbirds that were left in South, South America. They are, you know, today one of the largest radiations of songbirds in the world. The, the tyrant flycatchers, the oven birds, the fenariates huge radiation of these subossian songbirds in South America. And they are a really old radiation of songbirds that would have come from Gondwana land at some point in, in the past. That, that's great hearing you geek out so much about. How, in, in Singapore as a kid, what were the places that, that you went to to look at birds apart from just in your home patch, in your home block? Where could where, where did you head out and how difficult was it as a kid to go bird watching? I'm not rich, so I live in an apartment block. And so I don't technically have a home patch because in my immediate area, it's mostly the same old garden birds, a couple of sunbirds, a couple of orioles, the usual miners and crows. And this is actually the big contrast with living now in the US. Singapore has a pretty decent public transport system. And so getting around wasn't so hard. You have urban parks, urban gardens, which have a certain variety of birds. But then you have the rainforest. You have some of these offshore islands like Pulau Ubin, which has pitters spilling out everywhere. Every corner you have pitters these days. You have mangrove forests like Sungai Bulo, which I'm sure many Australian birders who've been to Singapore would be intimately familiar with. And so it is, it's a matter of just going out and, and looking for birds. I think, and this is something I think all bird watchers really appreciate. It's that you can't wait for the birds to come to you. You have to go to the birds. And if you make it, if you make an effort, there will be birds near or far, so long as you put in some effort. And that's the story of Singapore. <laughs> yeah. So Singapore is uh, a country of how many million now? Now I think coming close to six million people on a landmass that is a fraction the size of of Australia. Obviously, <laughs> it's a really small yeah. island. So what's the area, the square footage? Well, oh, I can, I can look it up. Hang on. Just no, no, don't, that, I'll bring it up on the screen <laughs> after looking up. But it's like for Australians, David, you've done some bird watching in Australia, I'm guessing now. Here and there, yeah. I've only been to so, Perth and uh, Christmas Island. Okay. <laughs> so, well, well, Christmas Island is how, bi how big compared to Singapore? Oh, God, I can't even remember. About one-eighth of the size of Singapore? Perhaps, yeah. The, the usual frame of reference I give for most international audiences is that Singapore is about the size of four New York boroughs. So it's just okay. just okay. Like so, smaller than the entirety of New York City. Yeah, so New, so New York is four-fifths approximately the size of Singapore. Yeah, thereabouts. So it's a really small island, but the benefit is that everything is very compact. So if you visit Singapore for bird watching. You can more or less bird the whole island in two days if you really put the, the pedal to the metal and you just jet around the country on the car. And, and if you're ticking off a list, if someone right. went to Singapore for two days and was dedicated to go birding and not shopping, what would be a good number? And, and is it seasonable? It is very much seasonal, right? You want to be coming during the migration season when you can get things like blueing pitters in, in an urban park hooded pitters in an urban park. So the total number of species is about 400. People doing big years tend to come very close to 300. So maybe about 100 to 200 species will be a good sort of ballpark to tick off. If you're visiting Singapore in two days, 150 will be very respectable. You'll have to bird really hard. But if I know many Australian birders and they're some of the, the, the most intense birders I've ever met in my life. I'm sure that's you know reasonable. Obviously, you want to be hitting up as many habitats as you can from the rocky shore to the muddy shore, to the, the tropical rainforest, to the mangrove forest, to the trashiest urban parks where, you know, who knows what you might find. That's astounding, isn't it, to think that in a couple of days you're going to maybe tick off a couple, uh, 100, 150 species. 
100, let's say 100. 100 is a bit, it's a bit ambitious, but yeah. That is astounding. Okay, let's talk about migration season. Oh, yeah. Yes. And what's moving through Singapore. Right. So Singapore lies at this choke point in the uh, East Asian Australasian flyway, right? We get birds mostly coming down from East Asia. So um, mostly following the coastline, coming down. Some of them don't come as far south as Singapore. Some of them stop, you know, near Thailand. But by and large, most of the, the, the migrants that we observe coming through for the shorebirds, it's going to be the usual red changs and green changs. A lot of them will obviously go all the way far further down to Broome, which is the big staging ground for all these wintering uh, shorebirds. We will have a bunch of godwits here and there, Terex sandpipers, and the terrestrial migrants will be getting all these flycatchers, Asian brown flycatcher, brown chested jungle flycatcher, yellow rump flycatcher, which are migrating from probably South China, maybe even further north in the, the eastern seaboard of China. And there's going to be other kinds of... This year, for example, we've had some pretty impressive views of Himalayan griffin, which probably came from the, the South Asian and, and down in, into Singapore to Two years ago, we had this incredible eruption of Asian open bill stalks coming down from Thailand as well. So migration in Singapore is a really cool event, and there are always going to be surprises because who knows, right, what weather patterns or climatic patterns further north of Singapore could just drive down into Singapore. And it's really fascinating. So we get all these thrushes as well, a Siberian blue robin, which is actually a flycatcher, not a thrush, eyebrow thrush, Siberian thrush is extremely rare, but we do get them once in a while. And of course, the pitters, which are actually not really long range migrants, right? Uh, hooded pitter breeds in the, the foothills of the Himalayas all the way into southern China. Blue wing pitter, which is the sort of the main migrant, the migrating pitter that comes from Singapore, breeds in Indochina, so in, in sort of northern parts of Thailand. And they take this sort of short-range migration down into Singapore. So it's a really exciting place to to look for migrants. And once in a while, some of these weird northern species will show up. It's a lot of fun. What is the best time? Ooh. Somebody who's coming to do some ticking off on their life list. Right. When should they look at coming into Singapore? So from what we know, and a part of this comes from dead birds, which we haven't talked about yet, the peak movement of migrants happens in this one or two week window in mid to early of that's when a lot of dead birds will show up. And that tells us that's really when this huge wave of migrants are passing through. So unfortunately, right, if you come at different segments of the migration season, you're probably going to see different things because not all the migrants appear at the same time. But October is usually a good month to come through because a lot of these migrants are just winging their way through. Unfortunately, that means also that a lot of the migrants that are seen may not last for very long, right? But right now in February, I'm just getting my eBird alerts and there's so many unusual migrants hanging around. There is currently a von Schrenk's bittern hanging around somewhere in Singapore as well. We get all four Asian species of bittern. We don't get the Australasian bittern, unfortunately. And they migrate through and they usually, because they're migrants, they're sometimes found in the oddest of habitats, in an urban park, in a canal. And yeah, if you come at different times, you're going to see slightly different composition of species. The earlier you are in the migration season, so around October, you're going to get the main wave of birds coming through. And this also applies for the shorebirds because not all the shorebirds hang around in Singapore for very long. So sometimes you get the odd sandaling, fowler ropes. Fowler ropes hardly ever seen, but it, there is a chance they might show up. And you're going to get all these lesser sand plovers still in partial breeding plumage. Once in a while, a greater sand plover might show up as well. And a lot of them are going to be winging south towards Sumatra. Some of them will probably end up in Australia. Spoon-billed sandpipers. Oh, oh spoon-billed sandpipers. The last seen in Singapore, 1997, but we did have one individual that was tagged with a satellite chip, right? That made its way down East Asia, crossed over Malaysia, Peninsula Malaysia, didn't stop at all, and then ended up in northern Sumatra. That was, I think, Lime 7, right? That was part of a, a research project to track the movements of the Spielberg side by So we were all really unhappy that it skipped over the peninsula because if it had just landed in the peninsula, half of Singapore would have gone to chase that one poxy little bird. I'm sure of it, right? We had Nordman's Greenshank in Malaysia a few years ago. We saw 2018, I believe. That, yeah, and Nordman's Greenshank in Singapore has been quite rare, but it, it's been seen before. It's just that they don't really show up as often as, as we'd like. And, well, you know, you can't have everything. <laughs> no, well, you mentioned that your, your eBird alerts have been pinging off. So you're a pretty intense bird, there. There's no doubt about that. 
the, the Americans infect you with eBird and it doesn't go away. It's a, it's a long running disease. All right. You mentioned dead birds and we're both admirers of the work of the, the Great Lakes correspondent for the bird emergency, Heidi Trudell, the dead bird girl. Let's, let's talk about dead birds and see. So this all started really in very similar fashion to Heidi Trudell. It's a bird, a dead bird shows up. Someone writes about it and I happened to hear about it and I went to pick it up. And I just, I think it was, a, I thought it was a one-off thing. It was a black back kingfisher, which is, you know, a short range migrant that comes down from Thailand, from into China and winters in Southeast Asia. Really spectacular looking bird. One of the smallest kingfishers I've ever seen. It's really tiny, really colorful bird. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Right. And at the time I was an undergraduate, you know, in Singapore, I was studying birds, particularly I was studying bird genetics. And so really all, a dead bird is fantastic because it, you know, it's got all its meat and all its, all its tissues intact. And so I figured, all right, if this is happening out there, I'll just put out a notice on Facebook. And it's one of the rare positive users of Facebook, where I put out a note on Facebook, made it public. And I said, hi, if you see a dead bird, here's my personal phone number. Call me. I'll come and pick it up. Now, David, and then the when, phone started ringing. Where, where did you find the Kingfisher? What kind of building had it? Had it? I can no longer remember about the Kingfisher, but the first ever hitter, I think I picked up, hit a hotel in downtown Singapore, which I'm sure many of Australia, visiting Australians have, have stayed in before. I found someone called me and said, hey, this is really colorful bird. They said it was a Kingfisher in a pond somewhere in Singapore. So I went there, it was at a hotel. I was at a water feature, it hit the window, the glass window or the glass facade and just fallen straight into the pool. And it was a blueing pitta and it was such a gorgeous looking bird. And from that one pitta, right, over seven years, we picked up about 700 dead birds. And so we're nowhere near sort of the volume that the Americans are seeing. But nonetheless, we are still seeing a sizable number of birds knock into buildings. And from, you know, the data we've been collecting over the last seven years and eight, well, eight going on nine years now, it seems that pitters, especially blueing pitters and hooded pitters are particularly susceptible to building collisions. And it's, it's just, it's not something that I knew before, before, beforehand going into this. I didn't say, I'm just going to keep looking for pitters and, and record as many pitters as I can. It's like people see these things, they call me and I just pick them up. Right. And it turns out that pitters are what we call super colliders. They just seek out glass and knock into it. So is your experience similar to what Heidi has told me before, that it's not the height of the building that is is what makes them murderous? It's just the very presence of glass. So is your experience that it doesn't need to be what we think of a high-rise building to be a real death trap for migrating birds that that low rise and just medium density ordinary housing is a killer as well so this is actually a very complex topic it's a topic that i've spent years now trying to wrangle with because right obviously a lot of the the knowledge we have about bird glass and bird building collisions in general come from the americas and uh, there has hardly been any research done on this in our part of the world, in Asia and Australia. I don't know of any studies coming out of Australia on this, actually, surprisingly enough. There were two studies coming out of Japan and Korea in the 90, in the late 90s. And then there's this huge gap, this huge gaping hole. But by and large, we're totally captured by the, by the property development industry. So nobody's clear about it. And the oil industry, to be fair. But no, so we, and bearing in mind as well that the approach that I took with surveying these bird building collisions was very different from what the Americans have been doing. So the way the Americans do it, and it's also been you know, partly a function of sort of the resources that one has and the ways in which the cities are constructed or, or, or organized, the Americans tend to f zoom in on very small groups of buildings. So they say, all right, We'll survey one to 21 buildings in this downtown area or on this university campus, and we'll figure out where the birds are dying within this very narrow frame. Now, if I did that in Singapore, I'd go a whole year and maybe find two dead birds, right? So instead, what I did was I said, look, the whole of Singapore is my, is my laboratory, right? If anyone sees a dead bird, just give me a call and I'll pick it up. What this means is that I miss a lot more birds. I'm probably only detecting a tiny fraction of, of you know, the, the number of collisions relative to the true 
number of colleagues, but it does mean that I get better coverage across a much broader swath of the city. Singapore has about 100,000 buildings. And so we're, we're better able to model this effect across space. And so what Heidi points out is broadly right, that building height tends not to have as strong an effect on the likelihood of collisions. And this is data that is fresh. It just came off the computer about a month ago. We're in the middle of writing this up for publication. We do see that short buildings, squat buildings, medium-sized buildings do kill a lot of birds as well, right? And a lot of that, of course, is you know, due to the fact that there's glass, but we're starting to realize that there are some really interesting patterns in the data that the Americans have not yet hit upon. So one of the things that we're actually really excited about, and this cuts back to the pitters, what we're seeing with pitters is that the likelihood of pitter collisions may be driven not just by light pollution, but blue light pollution in particular. This is something that's really weird. Why are pitters drawn to blue light? We don't really now, know. Now, let's clarify. Yeah. Blue light, are you talking about things like signage that has blue coloration for the tubes, or are you talking about what we're being uh, told about is damaging a human being, which is the blue light emanating from gadgets. Tell us, let's nail down exactly what... So we haven't been able to get down into that level of granularity, unfortunately, right? But what I did was I took a, a photograph of Singapore from the International Space Station. And this is purely by luck. An astronaut was floating over Singapore in the International Space Station, took out his camera, at, you know, it was nighttime in Singapore, took out his camera, snapped a couple of photographs of Singapore, posted it online. And so what I did was I took all of my dead birds, right, where we found them, and we have, we've mapped all of them out. Every single dead bird that we find has a GPS, a uh, pair of GPS coordinates attached to them. And so we mapped them out across space, and we tried to find patterns of where these birds were dying. So we used some, you know, very complex, fancy statistics software to cut out all the noise. But what we found was, at least in terms of the, the, the emitted light wavelengths, Areas with all blue light pollution, and these tend to be downtown areas because in Singapore, at least, most of our street lights are red because we use the old fashioned sort of sodium, uh, high pressure sodium vapor lamps, although we are switching to more white light. And it's really mainly right now in the downtown areas and shopping districts where you see a lot more white light being put out. Uh, whether it's by signages or whether it's by street lights, we can't really distinguish between those, but we do know that there is a lot more white light and therefore a lot more blue light in these areas. And these are where the pitters seem to be dying. And so this is really weird. That's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? That something that I, I, I'm sure you've noticed it too, but I've got a lot more miles on the clock than you do, David, but it's only in maybe the last probably seven or eight years that I've noticed that Vehicle headlights now, when they're not pointed straight at you, if you look at them, they appear blue rather right. than blinding white, that yellow white light that we always had. Do you think that could it be a contributor? I'm not to, I'm not suggesting that an individual car light is doing it, but that blue spectrum light is increasing because cars are now emitting that light in that spectrum that they didn't do before? That's a good question, but I think it's more... Vehicle lights are what we call transient lights. They're not permanently fixed to a spot, right? Uh, I think what probably still has a much stronger effect would be street lights that are static and they on one spot constantly beaming down particular frequencies of light. And so this is, I think, a very interesting topic because there has been a flurry of research coming out, again, mostly from America, showing that birds are attracted uh, to light pollution in, in urban areas, especially the birds that migrate at night and pitas, famously night migrants. Now, the question is, are there differences between the light spectra? Our study seems to suggest as much. There was a study from China that wasn't looking at bird building collisions. They were just looking at the effects of light. So they had three mist nets, one lit red, one lit blue, one lit green, and they reported that the mist net that was the blue caught a lot more migratory birds than the other two nets. So there seems to be a growing body of evidence that potentially blue light pollution might have some interesting effect. Whether How this sort of translates down to cars, we, we're not entirely certain. We do know, of course, that roadkill is also a big drop of mortality, 
not just in birds, but also in mammals, where we know that owls are particularly susceptible to, to, to collisions with cars because they swoop down over these roads and but they come exactly to the right level as these cars are and they get, they get knocked over. We see this quite often with hooded pitters as well. Hooded pitters, for some reason, 50-50 chance they're either killed by, by a building or by, or run over by a car. So I, I think what I'm getting at is that there's a lot of unknown drivers that we're only really sort of scratching the surface of. And that's only because we've just started looking, right? This project is almost 10 years old. It's ready to go to school, really. But yet, it's only when we start digging into the data that we start realizing that there might be some of these patterns and drivers we can potentially work on. So with light pollution, we can just tune down our lights to have less blue. If you have LED lights, for example, LED lights can be adjusted. The color temperature can be adjusted. So perhaps during the migratory season, if we know that blue light is harmful to migratory birds, we can tune it to become warmer rather than cooler to reduce the amount of blue light we put out. And these are all interventions that could very well save birds. And there's known knowns and there are known unknowns and there are... The known that we don't know. That we don't know. <laughs> ah, right. Okay. But there are other factors as well that are really interesting. And so this is, again, going back to this huge dichotomy between most of this bird strike research coming out of North America. Now, in North America, it's mostly temperate, right? And so a lot of the focus of the North American research on, on, on bird building collisions has been on migratory species, so species like your thrushes and your warblers, new world warblers and new world flycatchers. And a lot of people have ignored the tropics, right? Where we have a huge bunch of non-migratory resident species, right? And when we started looking at the data, we started realizing that it wasn't just the migrants that were slamming into windows. It was things like green pigeons. It was things like emerald doves, which Australia has as well, right? But among the super colliders, green pigeons and doves, right? Were some of our, you know, most abundant bird building collision victims. Right. And this is not something that you would get if you just looked at Chicago and Illinois and parts of Michigan because they don't have green pigeons there. They don't have emerald doves there. Right. And then you start casting it a, a, a bit wider and you realize the, uh, the conservationists in Taiwan are seeing the exact same phenomenon. They're seeing emerald doves, which they have as well, slamming into buildings. In fact, they see things like barbets, right? Taiwan barbet slamming into buildings as well. So, what I'm trying to get at is that once you start going beyond North America, the patterns become more complex and they become more interesting as well, right? And we're starting to realize that a lot of this, these collisions are not just involving migrants, but also involving resident birds. In many cases, also because many of these resident birds are young, so they're fledglings that just come out of the nest. And in addition to being pigeons are dumb, right? <laughs> They're not the smartest birds on earth. The naivety of young birds means that they maybe have a higher risk of colliding with buildings as well. But even more interestingly, when we look at the spatial patterns, where we find pigeons and starlings colliding with buildings tends to be near forested areas. So if you have a building that's near a forested area, you're going to see a lot higher likelihoods of pigeons and starlings, another rest and frugivorous birds mostly slamming into your windows. And so this is actually very useful, right? Yeah. It tells us, and this came out of a conversation with Heidi, a lot of these interventions that we're thinking about how to make buildings bird safe are really expensive. And because of that, you get a lot of resistance from stakeholders because they don't want to be putting out money just to save a few birds. But if you can say, all right, we know where these birds are going to be dying, Right. We know that it's not uniform across the landscape. We know that if your building is about four to five floors and near, near a forested area and lit by blue lights, then maybe you'll want to mitigate against bird burning collisions in these areas and not just blanket across the whole city. There's a couple of interesting things that need to be pulled out in the discussion, though, because those birds that are not migratory, and you're talking about things like fruit doves and and pigeons, it, the light isn't a factor for, for them. So they've got to be pulled into a different discussion. And it comes into how, how do birds place themselves in their environment? What are the visual cues they take? Is it a matter of reflection or do they have some other way of placing themselves in relation to a woodland area, a forest area? How do they recognize it? There's all these things that we don't know. 
and that we we're assuming that they recognize things the same way we do visually, but we don't know how they find their way on migrations. So it could all be tied into that, to a mechanism that we don't understand yet. Mm-hmm. No knowns, no unknowns. But we know what we suspect and what we speculate, at least for the, for the pigeons and the starlings, right? It's, I think, no coincidence that these species, these non-migratory resident species that tend to knock into buildings are forest edge dwellers. They are frugivorous, right? And by nature of being frugivorous, a lot of these species are highly dispersive, highly nomadic. We see this with the fruit loves in Australia. They wander around these landscapes, flying between forest patch and forest patch, looking for fruits. Because fruiting is not a homogenous thing. It's once the patch runs out of fruits, these birds are going to have to go somewhere else to find food again. And so what it suggests is that every time these birds are trying to move between patches, they're encountering these big classy buildings, and that's probably where they're going to be colliding. And of course, if you have a highly reflective window, and in this reflection you see a tree, the bird's probably going to try to make a beeline for that tree to find a place to perch or a place to hide from a predator or a white-bellied seagull hanging around. And that's when they're going to be colliding with building. So that's my working hypothesis. But I think it's a reasonable sort of uh, uh, a hypothesis to make. No doubt. It's just that there are, there are just so many things that we don't understand about how sure. birds make decisions about where they're going to go next. And how does a fruit eater find the next patch of fruit? Do they remember where they have been before? Or is it just a totally speculative journey that they undertake? Do... Uh, our new building more murderous, for want of a... Yeah, so that's right. So if something pops up mm. in a forest edge zone, is that more likely to be a killer than one that has been there for years? So much, so much still to learn. Exactly. And this is why there needs to be more of this research in the tropics, because you're not going to get any of that information coming out of a temperate zone, because they don't have green pigeons, for one. They don't have fruit doves. In our part of the world, in the northern parts of Australia, in, in Singapore, the rest of Southeast Asia, all the way up to bits of China and Taiwan, and even up to the southern parts of Japan, this is probably a phenomenon that's happening. It's just that no one's, well, not that no one's looking, but no one's pulling all these threads together into a single story. Something that has popped into my mind while we've been speaking, David, and and I've got no idea if there's ever been any work done with this, but what about birds that are uh, locally migratory, maybe just moving through altitudes, winter and, and summer? Do we know if, for instance, I'm thinking about my local patch, the foothills of Melbourne and maybe Sydney up and up into the Blue Mountains. Do we know if n- non-migratory birds in the sense of taking massive migrations, but those that move like parawongs and I'm sure there's piles of others that are common Australian birds, are they falling victim to buildings? Do we know in, in that kind of <clears throat> movement? Is Your just- guess. Yeah. Singapore doesn't really have much elevation. We don't have much by way of seasons. So that's a fantastic question and something that I think Australian researchers are intensely well poised to address, right? Because I can't do that kind of research in Singapore. We don't have a mountain. Our tallest fe- ge- geological feature is about 163 meters above sea level. That's it's nowhere near a mountain, right? And we don't really have much by way of altitudinal migrants in, in, in Singapore at the very least. But yes, there are altitudinal migrants in Australia. There are short range migrants that just go up and down the hill slopes. We don't know. And I think this is actually a very fertile sort of area of research. And it can potentially shed very interesting light on how birds perceive the environment, right? The fact that we see that it is more than any other bird that we looked at, seem to be more more often attracted to blue light, suggests that there might be something about the, the, the way they perceive the world that may differ from other birds, right? And this is not just a blooming pitta, right, that we see in Singapore. A fairy pitta collides uh, with buildings as well in Korea and Taiwan. In fact, the second ever fairy pitta record in Australia was a bird that slammed into a window and then got killed by a cat. I think that was near Broome or somewhere in the, the northern part of Australia in 2019. We have records of Indian pitters flying into people's buildings as well. There are a few sporadic records of African pitter, which doesn't fly north to south. They fly east. To, they migrate east to west, knocking into glass as well. 
So this might be a pitta white phenomenon, but yet the driver of this, the source of this still remains completely unknown. And that's really exciting. That means that there is something about these birds that the way they perceive the world around them, that remains mysterious to us. And I find that really exciting. Well, the, you're not going to run out of things to uh, <laughs> research. For sure, when, no, yeah. When you've finished your current PhD work. David, I'm really wondering what other species of birds are really prominent in the bird kill tally that you've um, discovered in Singapore. We- right. So we call these our super colliders, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what, what other, are there other particular families or are there other particular species which are really prominent in your counts? Right. So among our super colliders are the pitas. For the residents, it's the green pigeons, the treron uh, green pigeons and the, uh, the carcophaps, emerald doves. We do also have a fair number of jambu fruit dove, but jambu fruit dove is a bit odd because it's slightly more it's not strictly migratory, it's not strictly resonant, it's more nomadic. But the other groups of birds, are, in a big way, are the bitterns. Black bittern, cinnamon bittern, von Schrenk's bittern and yellow bittern all show up dead in Singapore during the migration season. And black bittern, obviously, Australia has as well, but they're not migratory in Australia. And that's something that's also very interesting and something I'm hoping to dig into at some point in my research. And the other no. big one are the six. Sorry, David, maybe yeah. do the genetic research and realize that it's two different species and you'll get another Might pick. well be. That's right, yeah. And the black bittern goes all the way out to the Solomon Islands, right? There's one subspecies in the Solomons, which is a really interesting phenomenon. And the last a super collider, well, the, no, two more super colliders are yellow rump flycatcher, the fascicular flycatcher. And I think also the first fascicular flycatcher was seen in Australia not too long ago as well. Right, and just in one tree near the desert, and it might have been a Mugimaki flycatcher, a Narcissus flycatcher, one of one of the two, and uh, yeah, and the the six, the uh, the dwarf kingfisher, the, in in our case, the black back dwarf kingfisher, which kingfisher, which uh, David Wells, the eminent ornithologist of Southeast Asia, once remarked that he had never ever recaptured a ringed Oriental dwarf kingfisher, which suggested many of them might be dying during the migration probably from building collisions. It's fascinating, isn't it? I'm going to have to set up my eBird. Or, uh, <laughs> is Aramea still going? I used to get the alerts from... Oh, no, I don't follow that, no. Uh, I used to get the alerts from Aramea before eBird was even a thing, but I, I'm not keeping up with, with those notifications. Right. But what really I'm hoping for is that more Australians especially, right, start reporting these dead birds. We don't really have any good records of noisy pitta or rainbow pitta knocking into buildings. They might not be at all, which actually would also be very interesting. But we know that noisy pitta does migrate, right? Not very long distance, but they do go from south to north. They sort of winter near Queensland, sometimes even in Papua New Guinea, and they go back down south along the east coast as well. Do they knock into buildings? There's not a lot of data to to say say much, but they might well be. It's just that we're not noticing. I have to think that maybe reaching out to James Cook University and and someone in Port Moresby might mm. be to collect some data. Right. What I wanted to ask you specifically about the community involvement that you started, David, with trying to collect the corpses that have been murdered by our, our buildings. What is the industry view of what you're trying to do and are they receptive to Right. So the, this happened all by mistake or by, by this, none of this was pre-planned, right? The idea of turning this dead bird thing into a, a community or citizen science project was completely unplanned. And we started very small, right? But the idea was that as you find a dead bird, you talk about it. You make a Facebook post, you make an Instagram post, you talk to journalists, tell more people about it. And slowly but surely, this information has started percolating out beyond my immediate circle of biologists, beyond just the people who who like birds, who watch birds, but it started gaining traction with the public. People actually talk about these things these days, right? These days, you have people posting. It's one of the, the rare, I feel, benefits of social media. People post these things online, other people see it, and they start talking about it. And because people have been talking about it, the government has started to take notice, right? In Singapore, a lot of the things are driven by the government, right? This isn't obviously the case in many other parts of the world. And so that's why it's the approach towards ameliorating and mitigating bird building collisions. There is no such thing as a one size fits all, right? In America, for example, the cities are so spread apart. There is, you know, so much devolved devolution of authority 
to local councils and local governments that you can't do the same thing in, in Singapore. In Singapore, the government has a lot of say. So it's talking to friends who are in the government, talking to, to the public, talking to the newspapers, that people have started to, this issue has started to percolate into the public consciousness. And because of that, right, we now see that there are ministries in the government, I can't say too much, but there are ministries in the government coming up to me and saying, all right, we know this is going to be a problem, or we know that this is already a problem, what can we do to fix it, right? And so it's taken many years for this to happen, but it's starting to, to enter popular discourse. And I think that's a very good thing. Yeah. David, you said earlier that you grew up in an apartment. So what is it like for people living in Singapore? How many people actually have a home garden? Oh, very few. And, okay, so I'm guessing that's only like the upper class, the rich and the powerful who are enjoying gardens and birds in the garden. So how connected is the general population of Singapore to bird life on a day-to-day basis in their experience of their daily life? We are in the tropics and there are birds everywhere. Obviously, I think for a lot of people, right, uh, a lot of their experience of nature is not entirely positive, right? In Australia has Pacific coel, we have Asian coel, same kind of bird, same kind of behavior. Noisy, 5 a.m. in the morning, just making a big, great big ruckus outside your window and everyone hates it. So that obviously is a huge part of how a Singaporeans, people in Singapore experience nature. But what we've realized over the years as well, and this is also in part because of COVID, but also because of social media, that there is a huge appetite for nature in Singapore. Singaporeans actually are very fascinated by nature because, partly because, many of them grew up in this apartment. Their direct interaction with nature becomes very limited. So if you go to a nature reserve in Singapore on the weekend, it's packed. It's crowded. We have one canopy walkway in one of our forest reserves. And it's, to get on that walkway, you have to join a, you have to join a queue and queue for half an hour to get on that walkway. Singaporeans are genuinely excited by nature. They don't always know how to interact properly with nature, which is a big problem across cities all across the world, right? You hear the occasional stories of wild boars or monkeys getting into scrapes with people and once in a while otters as well. We've got otters in Singapore. So I think one of the things is that it's, it's a very complex issue. It's the fact that many Singaporeans grow up in apartments, so they don't have a backyard. They don't have, they don't have their own personal garden, but we also do have a fairly decent network of public parks and people. These parks are well visited by people. And so people do see nature. The only problem is that they don't often have the right sort of vocabulary, the right sort of background information to be able to pass what they're seeing. Right. And so our, my job and our job broadly as, you know, bird nerds, as biologists, as scientists, as communicators is to help the public interpret what they're seeing. So when I did all this dead bird collection stuff, right, often I get people who have no idea what they're seeing. They say, I found this kingfisher uh, dead on the floor in a shop and it's a, and what I do is I then take my time to explain to them what it is they found, why it's there what I'm going to be using this bird for. And sometimes this can run into the... I've once spent like one full hour just talking to a resident uh, who had a private house or well, someone who had had found a a dead pitta on a balcony in an apartment block and and she wanted to listen. And it's because people are genuinely curious about nature. I honestly don't think you'll find many people who don't like nature, right? A lot of people are truly curious about nature, especially people living in cities. And so a lot of what we need to do is to bridge that gap, that knowledge gap. A lot of people have no idea what they're seeing, but they are seeing things. And so that's it's hopefully what, what I've been able to do over the last few years, collecting dead birds, really. It's just something that come to mind, David. It sounds like we should be trying to run like uh, little webinars, for want of a better term, uh, once in a while coordinating with neighborhood groups and whatnot and government people, university people who can talk to someone like you about bird strikes and actually learn about what they've got. Nowadays, someone can take a really good photo of something they've done and ask you a question in, in a forum like this. Exactly. With, with these smartphones, right. everyone's a photographer these days, right? Everyone's a togger. Yeah. So I'm just running through my mind now about how to create some more work for both you and I don't. So, <laughs> what, what I did want to ask you about Singapore in particular, is there a 
introduced bird issue and are there pest bird species that have adapted amazingly well to human development and our ways? I don't think Oh, what city doesn't, right? But do you have particular ones? I mean, here in Australia, we've got the white ibis, the cockatoos starting to learn how to get into bins and brush turkeys in the subtropics. Noisy Uh, miners as well. Noisy miners. What about the bloody Indian miner? That's right. Tell us about what what the urban bird highlights and lowlights are in Philip. So it's actually a very complex story. It's easy to just say, oh, a lot of these birds are pests. So we in, in Southeast Asia, our main sort of pest urban bird species, the Javan miner. For some reason, the Indian or the what we call the shit, the common miner. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Um, the common miner is a lot less abundant relative to the Javan miner, which has really expanded its range across huge swaths of Southeast Asia, right? Originally from Java and then trade meant that they started getting out into Singapore and in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and even north of that, displacing other native miners species can I just, as well. Can I just stop you there? Is that yeah. because it was such a common cage bird? And have they been, has it been introduced maybe accidentally over a large area or have oh, they think- naturally expanded their range? So, that's a good point. I think the current consensus is that the Javan miner didn't spread from the cage bird trade, but it spread because of just hitchhiking of boats and, and, and other kinds of inter, inter-island trade. The, the species that spread naturally, we think, may have been the Indian miner or the common miner because they would have come just south from, from the subcontinent into Southeast Asia. Things like Asian coel was rare in the 1930s and now super abundant today in part because of the introduction of house crows into Southeast Asia during the, the, the Second World War, probably, by, I think, by the Japanese, or just before the Second World War, thereabouts, right? That, and so they have That's hosts. really interesting. That's really interesting. So do you think that the, the Coel followed the crows? Or my mind, as a horticulturist, might be that maybe the colonial plantings in all yes. the cities that, that were, and the street trees that were chosen and the garden plants of the settler class may have facilitated that. Too. So it's because- it's twofold, right? Yeah. Because Asian coels, they're native to the, mon- the tropical monsoon rainforest in the north, right? And in many cities, right, because of the urban heat island effect and the way in which we do urban planting, right, many of our cityscapes and the, the treescapes in cities tend to be very similar to the sort of drier forests of the north. And so it's probably this twofold confluence of factors where all of a sudden you have suitable hosts for these coels, which are the brood parasites, the crows and the orioles. But then also you have very suitable sort of environmental conditions for these coels to thrive, right? The fruit trees that we plant in our streetscapes as well. These probably just combine to, to make conditions particularly fertile it's never always it's never u- usually just one factor same thing with yeah, the goffins cockatoo and earlier on the yellow crested cockatoo as well right these are species that were abundant in the bird trade but if it were just to release one cockatoo it'd probably just die on its own but because it's got food because there's enough critical mass of these cockatoos in the bird tree that escape they start forming these feral populations and all of a sudden they become these established species. But the funny thing, and this is the complicated thing about the, a lot of these sort of what we call pest birds, is that Javan minor in its native Java is endangered. It's threatened by the bird trade. Goffin's cock, not so much Goffin's cockatoo, but a yellow crested cockatoo endangered by the bird trade in its native Australasia. So there is an argument being made right now that many of these sort of invasive populations are actually insurance populations. Yeah, that's, that's right. They're insurance populations and they're, and if they have come from original lineages from the original bird trade, pet trade, there's going to be a genetic reservoir that is no longer available in the indigenous, for want of a a better terms, indigenous Very much so. so, so th- this is a huge topic of research in Hong Kong. Uh, people like Dr. Caroline Dingle, Dr. Uh, Alex, Dr. This fantastic sort of new realm of research looking at, at the broader picture of bird conservation because we are in our part of the world in the middle of a crisis, right? The demand for songbirds is causing rapid declines in many bird populations. Bali minor, nearly extinct. Blackwing starling, more birds in captivity than there are in the wild. It, it is starting to become really dire. And, and we are really starting to have to shift our thinking to, towards looking at these pest birds and thinking, maybe they are the last hope for this species, oddly enough. 
And sometimes, too, going off topic a little bit here, but it's raised, come to my mind from what you've just been talking about. When, when I was a kid, I wanted to have aviaries and have birds in cages that I could look at every day and whatnot. Then my shifting radically moved to, no, no, the best bird is one in the wild and whatnot. And now I'm coming back to thinking, hey, some of Australia's rarest parrots have large populations in European and British collections, avicultural collections. So maybe we should be talking about bringing some of those old genetics back into Australia and then reintegrating them into a uh, bit by re selective reintroductions Ooh. into it. But all these things have ethical issues. And then the other thing I always bring up, what's the point of captive breeding and releasing if there's nowhere for the bloody birds to live? Right. So genetic rescue is something that people have been thinking about, think people have been exploring, but it is really complicated. It's not my field for sure. It's really complicated. It is it's rife with ethical problems, right? In a sense, might you also be incentivizing and encouraging you know, people to keep captive birds, which we honestly don't want to be doing. But you're right. At the very fundamental level, you still need habitat. So it's, there's no point in taking a bunch of, say, night parrots and just releasing it into, into, into nowhere, or orange crown parrots or swift parrots, and then there's nowhere for them to live. All the forests have been bulldozed for logging. So I think at the very baseline, we still need to think about habitat, right? What are the habitats that many of these threatened species need? What are the habitats that swift parrots need in Tasmania? What are the habitats? Now, how can we, for example, right, as sort of people living in urban areas to, to, to a large extent, do in our backyards with our urban plantings that may potentially encourage certain species to, to, to establish or persist, right? That's and, a really interesting thing that you've mentioned there. And talking about the swift parrot, if the swift parrot and they preserve habitat in Tasmania, it still needs habitat in the mainland. And it does. that's the problem. That's Very much the problem. So. And of course, it's easy for governments and for anyone seeking election to look good by throwing money into a preservation program that partners with a zoo, right? With captive breeding. It's much harder for that bloke to look good by telling a property developer that he can't do something with that 28 hectares that borders a degraded state forest. That, so the cost is always in preserving habitat, not in trying to repair habitat. The cost is always in keeping existing ecosystems intact and in place. So I don't know, David, we just have to keep, <laughs> we just have to keep banging the drum and shaking the tree. And, and what not too hard. To, yeah, no, not too hard. And, and <laughs> because we don't want to dislodge fruit that could be feeding green pigeons, right? That's right. Um, yes. Now, tell us a little bit about New Mexico as a bird nerd. What do you get up to on your weekends there? Okay, the problem with New Mexico, I, being from Singapore, we have a pretty good public transport system in Singapore. I don't know how to drive, and New Mexico is a is a state built around the car. So if you don't drive, it's very hard to get around. But thankfully, my colleagues drive. So I often pay for the gas and we go out on these birding, bird watching trips. But this is the thing, the Southwest, the American Southwest is really the heart of American bird watching because it's really where you get this confluence of three, four, five different habitats coming together in this really tight area. In the North, you have the Rocky Mountains coming down South. So you get these montane birds like mountain bluebirds, even ptarmigans, it's the further North you go. Right. And then it, uh, on, on our eastern flank, you have the Great Plains. So these huge grasslands and all these grassland adapted species like meadowlarks and all these North American sparrows. The further south you go, you start drifting towards Mexico and all these Mexican birds that do make their way up once in a while, especially uh, following these mountain ridges that are mountain chains that come up from Mexico. So if you go to Arizona, the southeastern corner of Arizona is the holy grail of North American birding because it's where you get things like uh, neotropical trogons, right, that show up once in a while. Things like olive warbler, things like uh, this one species of Picard that that breeds in, in southeastern Arizona, that tiny corner of southeastern Arizona. So it is a fantastic part of the world to be in, right? You have the desert, you have the mountains, you have the great, sorry, the great plains, you have the, the Rio Grande River Valley. It's remarkable. 
Right. I did go out on this whole day long birding trip last week, last Sunday, and we got a, we had about 80 species in just one day, right? Just going from Albuquerque south towards El Paso at the border with Mexico. Obviously, we were chasing lifers. There was a, a, a rufous back robin, which is actually a thrush that was seen at the dam. We got that. And there was this weird hybrid hummingbird that's probably a hybrid between two different genera of hummingbird, very likely a hybrid between Anna's hummingbird and a broad-built hummingbird, which is incredibly unusual. And it looked like such a weird-looking bird as well. So it is a fantastic part of the world to be based in, if only I had a car. Have you got anything planned for uh, for the global big day? Oh, geez, no. I'm, I'm a PhD student. I don't have time to plan more than an hour ahead of time in my life. I would very much like to go birding. I've got a ton of stuff to do. I've got people hounding me for <laughs> for very tight deadlines. I feel like the global big day, obviously, is there. there is an audience for that. And I like to bird at my own pace and my own time. And it is... There's a lot of birding to be done anyway. A lot like me. Now, I hadn't planned to go here. I hope you're happy to talk about this. But I've talked to a lot of PhD candidates over the life of the bird emergency, but we've never, we've often talked about field work, but you just mentioned that you're probably too busy to get out in the field. Tell us a little bit about what the life of someone working on a PhD is actually like. What are the things you have to complete? Day to day, people oh. always talk about oh, we're in the lab. Just give it, give someone who has got no idea about. We do classes still, right? We still have classes yeah. to do a lot of the work. So my work, to be fair, a lot of my field work was the last seven years because all these pitters that die, their tissue samples are now my, for my research. So I have been collecting these, you know, tissue samples for a really long time, and we're hoping to mine information out of these tissue samples. So a lot of the work I'm currently doing is either computer-based or lab-based. In the lab, a lot of what I do as, as someone who studies the genetics of birds is we do a lot of DNA extractions, usually just moving clear, smelly liquids from one container to another until something happens. <laughs> Following, it's like baking. It's, it's why I like to cook. Cooking is following a recipe, exactly the same in laboratory science. You're given a, you have a recipe by and large. You know what your reagents are. You've gone to the very expensive supermarket to buy these very expensive salts and very expensive clear liquids, and you're just combining them in the right way to produce a product. Please tell me you have a white coat with your name on it. Oh, no, I don't. No, that's a very doctor thing. <laughs> Here in the biological sciences, we're a bit more like, I do have a white coat, not with me now in my office. But a lot of my other work is on the computer because once we get all sort of, we go out, we get the tissue samples from these birds, from birds that knock into buildings, and then we take them into the lab and then we start extracting DNA. We prepare the DNA for sequencing. It goes out to a DNA sequence. And then what comes back is a thumb drive, right? It's a pen drive with data on it. And then what, happens next is we have to make sense of this data on the computer. So most of my time is spent on the computer, mostly screaming at the computer, trying to get stuff to work. It's no different from many office jobs, really. But you're not cut and pasting in Excel, right? You're, no, you're some using, people do use Excel. But you're using a statistical analysis program, I'm guessing. Right, right. And a lot of what I'm working on right now, actually, I'm writing a software right now that sort of looks at so not so much the genetics of birds, but how animals disperse between islands, right? So one of the things you, we, we know that Australia is an island in a sense that was not didn't always have the same shape, right? 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, Australia was connected to Papua New Guinea. Now, how do we quantify this change in the coastline of Australia? For Australia, obviously, that's mainly where the, the coastline changes occur. But what about these small island archipelagos in, in the South Pacific? sea level change would have had dramatic effects on how these islands uh, look like in the past. And so what I'm trying to work on right now is a software package to visualize this, to quantify this, so we can then link that to the genetic data that we are all producing as biologists to see how we can draw links between um, historical sea level change and how birds have colonized these islands over time. It's really exciting. That, that's a fascinating area of study. I'd love to follow up with you, with you on that sort of down the track. What One thing I did want to ask you more about the process of actually doing the work, David, is how much of the work you do is actually 
because you're still taking classes and you're having to support other academics, how much of the work that you do day to day in your office is actually working on other people's projects? Oh, no, I, most of the work I do is my own work. Thankfully, I do have lots of collaborations here and there, but a lot of them tends to be, well, in my case, at least a lot of them tends to be my leftovers that I've left <laughs> undone and other people are picking up my slack because I generate, with all these dead birds generate so much data. Right. So as uh, uh, a student of mine who's now doing his master's degree in, in Singapore, he started out as an undergraduate. He said, Hey, I'm interested in, the, in these dead, in these dead birds. And so I said, All right, go, but oh, here's a toothbrush, brush these birds with parasites. And, and it turns out we're discovering all these incredible parasites on our dead birds. And he's just got a paper coming out this week on some of the lice and some of the blood sucking flies that we're finding on these birds. And so there is so much to be done, right? Whichever nook and cranny you look on these birds, there is going to be interesting information to mine. There's going to be interesting stories to tell. There's going to be in, in the exciting new research to, to discover. And unfortunately, I seem to be the bottleneck in most of my research because I'm very slow. But yeah, so this is the life of a researcher. It's collaborating with other people. A lot of it is spent trying to make sense of information. A lot of it is also making mistakes. Right. When we, when you sit at the computer and scream at the computer, it's not because the computer is dumb. It's because I'm dumb. Yeah. Right. Last one before we get into the, the bird emergency questions, David. The, if somebody is in Singapore now and because you're obviously not there and is noticing birds that are hitting buildings and dying, what should they be doing? And actually, let, let's, Maybe make it a little bit more general. If you're in Bangkok or if you're in Hong Kong and you are noticing birds that are in a, in a garden bed at the edge of a building or on a sidewalk, what should they do? How should they treat the bird? And where is a likely place that will accept it where it will be useful? So the best advice I can give, contact your nearest natural history museum or contact your nearest university biology department. You know, look for an ornithologist. So if obviously if you're in Australia, nearest university, whether it's UQ, JCU, ANU, whoever, they are, they'll all have a biology department with world-class biologists who I'm guessing would be more than happy to receive a donation of a dead animal, right? Not just birds, obviously. In Singapore, I've mostly handed over this responsibility to the Avian Evolution Lab run by my previous boss right, who is still carrying on this whole project of collecting dead birds, in part, obviously, because the tissue samples that come from these birds are really the bedrock of a lot of the research that needs to be done on Southeast Asian birds. The more we have, we know about the genetics of these birds, the better we can conserve them, the better we can understand how they evolved in our part of the world as well. Another thing that I recommend people do is use iNaturalist, where you can take a photo. Everyone has, most people have a smartphone these days. Grab a photo of the, the moment you take a photo of it, it's automatically geotagged. There is a GPS coordinate associated with it. You upload it. Scientists can go to iNaturalist and just download this data. So even if the specimen is not preserved, at least it's a digital record of the bird having been observed and verified at a particular location. So it's probably the best advice for everybody is to get iNaturalist onto your phone and use it. It means you don't have to pick the bird up if it's a bit manky, which often you don't find them for two or three days. Right. So as long as there's enough of the plumage there for someone to be able to identify, it will still be a useful uh, addition to the world of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, no, That's great. Now, David, is there anything I haven't asked you about pitters and migratory birds in Singapore <laughs> that you that you think I should have asked you? We've broadly covered the main topics, right? About how birds are knocking to buildings, migrants, many of them migrate at night. There's huge diversity of migratory birds in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think we've covered most of, of the key issues. And of course, we also talked about it with the example of the swift parrot in Tasmania, how conservation of many of these birds that move needs to cover more than one jurisdiction, right? You can't conserve birds by saying, all right, I'm just going to preserve one habitat here. Birds move around, right? And you have to think about it in, in broader spatial terms as well. Why don't those birds just go to the pack, the patch of mangroves that we've saved in Thailand? <laughs> Why do all these birds want to keep going to Korea? I don't understand. It's sad Why to can't the bird learn? 
But see, that is the perspective of a building, uh, you know, a development, someone who's, you know, a building developer or a government officer who don't, who doesn't necessarily understand life or nature, right? And so this is a big failing that we have in our education system. We don't teach people about the natural world. And because of that, you have this bunch of policymakers, bunch of business people, or business people, maybe they're motivated by other reasons. You have developers who don't understand basic ecology. Why can't the bird just go elsewhere? If it breathes here, exactly, just up and move somewhere else. Why don't they ask themselves, why don't they, why don't they still want to live in the uh, apartment? Right. So this is exactly why... This is exactly why right now we're seeing this renaissance of what we call science communicators, because we're starting to realize that, geez, the ways people don't know anything about the natural world. And there needs to be a way of conveying all this information to the public so that it's not just about awareness. I think broadly enough, broadly speaking, people have awareness. We've moved past the need to raise awareness. We need to now raise understanding and empathy for the environment. Right. And so this is actually really important. People are aware of nature, but a lot of people don't give a shit. That's the point. We, 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 even though what I'm doing is only about pushing out a message, but it's not a message to raise awareness. As you said, everyone knows that we've got to do stuff. Now we've just got to build the pressure to make people do stuff. But it reminds me of something. I can't remember who, who it was who said it, but. We are the most information rich society that's ever lived. But why is everybody? That's what fascinates me. Though. Well, because we've, we're now drowning in so much information that we've lost the ability to process and to be discerning and to distinguish between what's useful information, what is, and what is bullshit. So I think this is why, again, as communicators, as science communicators, there needs to be strategic efforts to make nature more understandable to the public, right? It's not just about podcasts are part of the thing. Podcasts appeal to a very specific audience. It's about finding ways of finding new audiences, new ways of doing things. One thing I do is I do school talks. Before I came to the US, I would do a school talk maybe once every, once every few months because that's a great way of reaching out to a huge audience many of whom are super interested in nature, right? You catch them young enough, they're really excited about even the ugliest looking insect. And if you can get a kid who is 5, 6, 10, 11, 12 years old, interested in bees and wasps, you've won that battle. They're going to be interested. That's that's right. Every revolutionary movement ever that's (laughs) ever been successful knows that you have to get them young, right? (laughs) Right. But it's about also... Much as zoos have, uh, there are, you know, issues with zoos, zoos are very important for conservation as well, right? So it's about making sure that your parks and your zoos are accessible to people. It's about making sure that people have access to the information and that you actively seek out measures of getting this information to people. Because otherwise, it's going to be all that rubbish propaganda. It's going to be rubbish nonsense. That's going to be polluting people's minds. So telling them, ah, who cares if this bird goes extinct? We've got other birds as well, right? And that is, you know, what we don't want people to be thinking, getting jaded with conservation because things are going extinct. Okay, I can't resist. What? <laughs> I, I can't resist, but I'm really interested in, in, in your perspective on this. Why is it important that we preserve the noisy pitter when we've still got other pitters. This is the thing, right? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. Someone made a song about this, right? And there, there are many facets to this. One, every species on earth does something. And whether or not we, and we benefit from that directly and indirectly, regardless of whether it's a binchuk or whether it's a noisy pitter, right? A lot of these animals in the wild do something and very indirectly they will have impacts on us. Once an environment starts to break down, we'll start realizing it. Once, for example, your dragonflies start disappearing, your mosquito population is then going to explode, and then people are going to start realizing, holy shit, maybe we should have preserved that pond, right? Instead of letting it become a puddle of stagnant water, right? That's one thing. But the other thing, and this is something that for some reason, despite the fact that we're seeing a rise in nationalism around the world, we don't see a concomitant rise in pride in our natural heritage. Every single one of us inherits a group of animals as part of our legacy, as part of our 
culture, right? So much of Australian culture is built on the birds and the mammals that live in Australia, the kangaroos, the kookaburras, in Singapore as well. We are inheritors of this natural legacy that has been left to us. And so why are we so proud about societal structures, but not as proud about the wildlife that is very much part of our culture and our heritage as well? Honestly, that should be the, the most important defining thing about many of our societies. It's the fact that we have this biodiversity around us. And that puzzles me, really. You know what puzzles me? I don't know. I don't know how much the colonial history of Singapore has rubbed off on you. But what? Why does the England cricket team have three lions on their jumper? It was the last time someone saw a lion in in England, right? It, it's just crazy. Why do so many countries have lions on their coats of arms? Well, Singapore has a lion on it. We don't have lions. But, that, but that's a probably a colonial throwback. Well, it's, it's part of the, the myths we tell ourselves. But regardless, right, nature should be something to be proud of. And I think this is something that we need to start shifting the conversation towards. It's that it's, it's okay to be, you have your history, every country has its history. But more importantly, a lot of this history is, I won't say fake, but it's constructed. But what's really real is the nature that lives and grows on the land whether it's the spinifex grass that grows in the plains in the northern in the, in the more arid parts of Australia, whether it's all the marsupials that live in weird places, whether it's the bogs and the rivers, these are all parts of the landscape, and it's things that should make every person proud to live where they are, right? What's so, the, what's the well, yeah. national bird? It's the construction crane. <laughs> Unofficially, our official bird is the crimson sunbird because it's small and red. It's a small red dot, like Singapore is on the map. And I, it's brilliant, right? So we need to do a better job of marketing. I think a lot of this is PR and marketing. We need to do a better job of marketing nature to the public because we know that the public secretly loves nature. No matter how much they complain about the Pacific Coel, no matter how much they complain about the galahs or the, the noisy miners near the house, people... Or, or, or for, for, for that matter, the magpie dive bombing people. We know that people love nature. So the question is, how do we make people excited and proud of their nature? Right. And this will translate down the line towards conservation mindedness. Fantastic. Are you ready for the bird emergency question? Dan? Let's go. Let's start with the, the controversial one. What is your field guide of choice when you're out in the field? Oh, shit. Depends on where I am, really. I, for Southeast Asia, I use, well, I used to use Field Guide to the Birds of Southeast Asia by Craig Robson. Now I've shifted to the more updated one, which is the Birds of the Indonesian Archipelago, written by James Eaton, Abbas Van Balen, and uh, Frank Wright, who is my previous boss. In North America, where I am right now, I still use the Sibley Guide to Birds. I may have a copy on my desk right now. Uh, I have a, I think it's slightly older edition copy on my desk. Yeah, the Sibley Guide to Birds. There we go. I, I, I love it when people can get their can get their field. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's also available as an app on the phone yeah. in case you're out in the field. Yeah, that is my 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 go to field guide. These are the two go to field guides of choice. I also recently traveled to the Netherlands and I used the Lars Svensson field guide to the birds of uh, Europe. I love collecting field guides, and not just contemporary field guides, but historical field guides as well, because they give you so much interesting information about how the way we look at birds, the way we think about birds has also changed, how species distributions have changed as well. It's really exciting. That, that's a really interesting point. I remember when I was a very young person and I was brought up on the Gould League of Bird Lovers have this series of bird guides and I was always waiting. I had one, two, three, four, and then I waited for number five and six and, and seven. But I was given a very early copy of what bird is that, which was, and I got it through the family and it was, so it was really tattered and torn when I got it in probably 1970. Well used, right? Something, yeah. <laughs> but it was really amazing how different the language that it was written in and the way the birds were referred to was compared to my next sort of favorite field guides that I loved to death, which were the Peter Slater field guides. And then I went on to his son and he's... That's the one I have. So I only have one Australian field guide and that's the one I have. I, I got it from, an, from a secondhand bookstore 
in it's somewhere in Perth when I was visiting a long time ago. I didn't. I, there we go. Yeah. I don't. I need a copy of you that. You have one. to I'll get, get this one too. There we um, go. Yeah. There, there's a bundle. I've got a. I've got a box with older ones as well that mm-hmm. I, I have. But yeah, th- this is I go to because I know where to find everything because I've yep. had it so long. But yeah, so the Sibley, you, you you love the Sibley. The Holy Grail of North American yeah. birds. I've got other field guides on my desk. I'm at my office right now. So I've got, let's see. Oh, oh, oh shit. <laughs> a bunch of books has oh. dropped. I've got uh, Birds of Central America. Very nice. Birds of the West Indies. Not used at all because obviously COVID has scuppered all travel. At some point, I'll, I'll get around to, to putting them to good use. And then on the more academic front, I have this cockroach killer over here, Birds of the Thai Malay Peninsula. This is more uh, academic. Okay. Actually, that's one I've been trying to buy second hand. Is that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who, uh, who can afford to buy it new? Only that's a university right. department it's out of, it's can buy that. Long out of print as well. So it's impossible to find these days. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a complete bird nerd. This is a guy <laughs> who can, he can get the field guides at his fingertips for two or three continents. I love it. I love it. <laughs> David, let's move on to the next one. I'll be interested in this because you're a modern young man as well as someone who appreciates uh, the traditional. So what's your essential piece of kit when you're out doing your field work? If you, if I could tell you, you could only take one thing when you walk out the door to get in the car that your friends are driving you off on the next field trip, what would it be? Without a doubt, binoculars. Can't live without it. I always have a pair in my backpack everywhere I go in case of emergency bird watching. That, that begs another question, doesn't it? What are you using? What are the binoculars that you take with you? So, well, that's an interesting story. And you, you've asked this at exactly the right moment because I just got back from the Netherlands about a month ago. And what happened was I dropped my pair of binoculars and they split right in two. But please tell me that you dropped them it, onto either a bicycle or a boat in the canal. Or you dropped it into onto the edge of a windmill. I dropped it on a supermarket floor while getting a croissant before going out bird watching. But it it had been getting a little bit wobbly over the last few years because it's one of the the cheaper Zeiss models. Zeiss makes good binoculars, but this is a more yeah because I'm a poor student, right? It's one of the cheaper models, so the outer sort of grip was getting a little bit brittle. So you know that what happened was essentially the strap snapped, right? This little bracket here snap the thing yeah. dropped on the floor and then it snapped right in two on my second day in the netherlands which was a huge problem because you know i was spending going doing a lot of birding while i was visiting the netherlands and so what i did was i sent the broken pair back to zeiss they're in austria so it's it's not that far away and they said you know what it's this is too far gone for us to service we're just sending you a new pair <laughs> how good sir well done well done zeiss i don't usually do a sort of endorsement or anything but that's good customer service exactly how you right. think you how long do you think your binoculars were eight years so that's i awesome. bought the first version of this pair of binoculars so i think they've zeiss has up one of the reasons why they probably replaced it is because they've updated the grip so it's more durable the first version of the terra ed binoculars that i bought had a sort of uniform slightly rubberized grip that was very brittle and so this one seems to be updated and they probably have run out of parts to service it so thank you zeiss for sending me a new pair <laughs> and no sponsorship David, at all. Yeah, David, forgive me for just for a moment. Hello, Zeiss. If you happen to watch uh, this, I also would love a pair of binoculars. <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I'll, I'll just clip that one out and throw it on the YouTube channel. And, there we go. And and see what happens. David, what about the phone? This is not, uh, this is an extension of that question. When yep. you, how much are you using your phone when you're just out bird what Are you religiously marking things off in, in, in an app as you're out on the day or are you like, using playback what so the americans have damaged me very badly because the americans are obsessive e-birders and so they will e-bird in real time as they're bird watching at the moment they see something it's going to go on the e-bird checklist in the past i used to be a bit more relaxed about this at the end of the trip you e-bird you frantically try to remember everything and you e-bird it at the end of the day. But more than that, the phone should become really important to me because I, as I grow older, as my bones start to become more brittle and tired, I've stopped carrying the camera. I used to carry this enormous monster of a camera. It's been up to Mount Kinabalu. It's been to, to Aceh and Sumatra with me. 
But it started to become a huge burden because it's so much kit to carry around. And so these days, I'm much more fond of digi-birding, of digiscoping and digi-binning, right? With the binoculars, I figured out a very good way of taking terrible but serviceable and identifiable photos of birds. Just twist up the eye cups, zoom in to about 50%, and then you just pop it on like this, and you can get perfectly usable bird photos. So you don't have to carry a heavy camera, and it's, yeah. There's so really about, cool, really cool adapters you can get to. That's right. For that. so, yep, exactly right. Yeah. So I feel the other thing as well to me is that the camera changes the way I, I see birds. The camera drives me to try to think about composition and the way the bird looks and the aesthetics of the bird. And that can sometimes be very distracting. Right. What I want to really be doing is just looking at the bird, appreciating its behavior and observing it. I don't want to be thinking about, am I in the right angle? Is it backlit? Is there enough light? What do, what do my camera settings have to be? I want to immerse myself in the experience of the bird, not the experience of photographing the bird. So it's something that, you know, I've started to, to shift more towards as I get a little bit older. The younger me would have been like, click, 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 binoculars, hardly even use at all, just the camera. But these days I'm trying to bird a bit more slowly, right? And with just the binoculars and, and the phone, I think it, it's more fulfilling that way. That's a really interesting perspective because, yeah, I have talked to quite a few bird photographers and sometimes their, their, their mindset about being in amongst birds is really different to that as I'm not a list keeper when it comes to birding. I'm, I'm just totally into the experience and that. I was going to do. I was going to do the sight gag with you about the e birders. Honey, have you kicked off the road set? All this. They're in a party of fifteen people standing there watching something. Going, honey, make sure you take it off your e bird. Oh God, to have someone to be your e bird mule. No, we do it ourselves. You know, I but don't, I don't even like talking if I'm birding around other exactly. other people. I think. I, I want it to be quiet. I want to hear the birds. I don't want to hear you talking about. And you brought up playback. So playback is starting to become more controversial. I think there's some photography competitions that have started banning. Playback, I feel, has its uses, but needs to be used sparingly, right? I've seen, unfortunately, from uh, being from Singapore, I've birded a lot around Asia, and the Asian photographers can be very aggressive with their use of playback. And that started to grate very heavily on me as well. So I got to Malaysia and you see these photographers with the tape playing on loop nonstop. That's not how playback's supposed to be done. Playback's supposed to be a sort of targeted burst of the song. So the bird maybe gets interested and comes a little bit closer. It's not meant for the bird to sit right on your camera. But that also tells you that those people have no idea about birds. If they they are continually playing the the song, an identification call or a territorial call of a bird that is territorial, that's the same as someone bashing on your front door nonstop with a sledgehammer for 20 hours. We could go on for another two more hours about this. This is a topic that I've actually, I'm actually very passionate about. And it's what has gotten many photographers angry with me because I feel that going back to the idea of how the camera changes the way you view nature, a lot of the increased accessibility of the digital camera and these long lenses has made bird watching a very different place these days. And it's not necessarily for the better, right? The problem is compared to a pair of binoculars, you have to get a lot closer to the bird with a camera to get a decent view, right? Because you have a frame that's a certain set of dimensions. You want the bird to be composed in a certain way. You want the bird to be visible to a certain extent. Right, you want to get as close as possible to the bird sometimes, right? People have taken what, passport photos of birds with just the, the cropped head of the bird. How close do you have to get to birds sometimes to be able to get the kind of shot? And because of this, it's changed the way uh, people interact with nature. And you, it leads to a lot of these behaviors like, you know, baiting. We see this problem with owls here in North America, snowy owls, people harassing the snowy owls, incessant use of playback, overuse of flash photography. And these are things that we really need to grapple with broadly as bird watchers and bird photographers to have the welfare of the bird first. But you will have people who have not a lick of knowledge about what the birds are, right? developing their own very silly ideas about how they're affecting the birds. So this is, yeah, 
complicated. <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself, David. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's, yeah, it's ethically quite challenging. And, and it's fantastic that people are taking photos and putting them out there in the world to convey some of the conservation messages that need to be made. But it's not a substitute for stamp collecting. And that's what uh, I wish people would, would would come to grips with. It's not mm-hmm. train spotting and it's not stamp collecting. So right. Stop. There's no point raising awareness about a really rare bird through photography if you've trashed the habitat in the process. And yeah. we see or, this or whenever... Or, or you've stressed it out so much that it flew away after you took the photo and dropped dead. Exactly. So the, one of the horrifying stories I saw, uh, this was in Malaysia, was up in Fraser's Hill, and, and there was a long-tailed broadbill nesting right above the trail. And you had these photographers there. Number one, they were smoking and just dropping the cigarette butts on the trail. Number two, they were playing the tape at the nest. Like, where do you expect the bird's going to go? It's nesting. Even if it's gone out to look for food, it's going to come back. So just sit there, don't make a sound, you'll get your shots. You don't need to use the tape. Yeah, that, <laughs> I mean, that's all kinds of levels of stupid, isn't it? Like, that's just amazing. <laughs> Let's get off that for a minute. Where's your personal favourite spot to that you've been birding or that you like to go regularly birding? In New Mexico, just around campus. Actually, you know what? It's always going to be just around campus because university campuses tend to have lots of nice trees. In Singapore, the National University of Singapore, there is a nice little forested area on campus where some really unusual birds have been seen. I was once bringing around a guest who was visiting from India, uh, no, from Bangladesh. And we had our first ever record of chestnut bellied Markova for that site and gray headed fish eagle and all these really cool birds on campus because we're in New Mexico and we have a duck pond. It's the only bit of standing water from huge radius around. So all these weird ducks show up. Right now, it's mostly mallards and, and wintering American widgeon. But once in a while, last week, we had a ringneck duck, and we often get these weird ducks once in a while showing up. And because there are trees and there's water, you get going to get all these hummingbirds coming back very soon, and all these you know wood warblers, the perulets, going to be coming through as well. Last year, we had a Canada warbler, show up and it's super, super unusual because we don't get that very often on this side of the flyway. So yeah, just, you don't have to go very far, right? Before I got here, one of my favorite spots was just the park near my house. I used to live near a river and this is an entirely artificial uh, habitat. This river had a floating wetland that was constructed in the middle of this river. It's just pontoons with tall grasses growing on it. And birds would show up, right? Purple herons would show up. We had Palace's grasshopper warbler show up for multiple years. It's probably the same bird that keeps coming back to this exact same, completely artificial, completely man-made uh, wetland. And yet there are still birds. So I, my general advice to people who are starting out birding is start local. You don't have to travel to to, to the, the densest forests of, of Borneo. You don't have to go all the way to Papua New Guinea to find cool birds. Start local and then work your way around from there. How, just an extension from something you mentioned about mallards, because you're from my corner of the world, Right, <laughs> mallards are not, are not duck free. We got plenty of ducks, but in the south. But what I've always wanted to know is, do you notice that there are hybrid mallards and other species in the populations that you're seeing in America? Is that a, so? We are on the that, northern that issue. We're on the northern edge of this um, hybrid zone between domesticated or the common mallard and the Mexican duck, which looks very similar. So, in fact, I think this Sunday, today there was reported a, a pure Mexican duck down by the Rio Grande River in the downtown area. So I'm going to be trying to carve out one day this weekend to just go there and see it. And it, it's a pure looking duck that's roosting with a huge bunch of hybrids showing slightly different traits mixed in here and there. But ducks, oh, yeah. You know, I'm from Singapore where we hardly have any ducks. We have the, the lesser whistling duck, occasionally wandering whistling duck, and then once in a while, extremely rarely, cotton pygmy goose, and then maybe huge five, ten year gaps before one of these vagrant ducks. There was a tufted duck show up, I think, showed up, I think, uh, a, a gadwall that showed up as well. But yeah, very few ducks. So growing up, ducks were never big on my radar. And then you start going further afield bird watching and you realize, shit, ducks are a pain in the ass to identify because there's so many hybrids. They're a real challenge. I mean, look, that's one of the great things. Australia's got so many unique ducks that we, 
once you sort them out, you're pretty right. On the related issue, the first time I showed up in Perth, I was so surprised to see Little Greep, which is not a duck, but it's like, yeah. just wandering around King's Park. And I was like, that's the same Little Greep we have back home. And, then I and it's up, not the same. It's not. It's Australasian Greep now, yeah. exactly. But then you look up the book and you realize oh, this Tachybaptist genus is such a huge range across the old world. It's remarkable. And and really, the, the only way to be sure that they are, in fact, distinct species is the genetic work that's been done. Exactly. So a lot of this work that we do has very real impacts, very pretty much, right? Australian black duck and all that. I, I, oh, God, I have such fond memories of bird watching at King's Park. It's such a beautiful place. Oh, when you come to Australia again, you can check out some. I'll be back. Yeah. Corner. I need to visit the Australian Museum. I need to visit the Western Australian Museum for my work. A lot of my work is museum-based these days, so... Well, I'll invite myself along. If you're going, if you come back and you're going on a museum trip, there we I'd go. Like to come and uh, be a fly on the wall and see how, see what happens when when scientists hang out at museums together. So, David, let me follow up on on your favourite bird watching place. What's your bucket bird watching location for your bucket list? Ooh, ooh, there's so many places. I'm, I'm looking at where I've been to. Right. And there's so many parts of the world that I've yet to see. I've yet to bird anywhere in South America. I've yet to bird anywhere in Africa. I've only birded small chunks of Europe and small chunks of East Asia. I've only birded Perth in mainland Australia. I need to get to the other side of Australia. I actually the one big bucket place I've been wanting to go to. Oddly enough, obviously I want to go to many places. I want to go to Halmahera. You know, Indonesia is going to take a lifetime to finish birding. That's one big thing I'm trying to do. But the one place in Australia I really want to bird is Darwin, because Darwin has so many birds. It's remarkable, right? That stretch from the desert all the way past Kakadu towards the Queensland side, where it becomes much more tropical, right? You have such a huge diversity of birds there. Obviously, Rainbow Pitta in, 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 in just outside the city limits of Darwin. I need to go and dig that for sure. Goldian finch, magpie goose, all these Australian endemics, all these really old lineages of, of, of birds, of songbirds that are in Australia. I need to spend a significant amount of time and money traveling through Australia, taking as many birds as I can. Better get them before they go on, Dave. That's it. I, I want to see a night parrot. I desperately want to see a night parrot i've shaken hands with a man who has once ringed a night parrot so i've got the, the scent of night parrots stuck somewhere in my paws make sure you keep an eye on the channel because we have a night parrot series coming up there we go yeah i won't name drop yet but we do have <laughs> we have a, a, a fair bit of night parrot coming up all right what is your favorite how dare you ask that kind of question how dare you? I am deeply offended by this. What is my... F how, do you, how do you expect me to choose? There are so many good birds out there. It's a challenge, right? But you have to have an answer for that. Oh, God. It's got to be a pitter. I'll, I'll, let you have, I'll let you have the genus that I would have let you have the family <laughs> if, you, if you needed to go that far. But honestly, oh, God. Mangrove pitter. It's such a weird bird. Right, it looks superficially like a blueing pitta, but it's got this honking great bill. It lives in the mangrove swamps, one of the best habitats in Southeast Asia, right, and most one of the threatened habitats of Southeast Asia. It's got this incredibly sonorous call, and they're just such beautiful birds. Pittas in general are gorgeous. The bandit pittas, the gurneys pittas, all these pittas are just remarkable birds. But yeah, it's so hard to decide because there are so many really exciting. Really cool. Really, you're better asking me continent by continent, which is my favorite bird, right? <laughs> to which I'll say, Africa, green-breasted pitta, Asia, <laughs> mangrove pitta, <laughs> Australia, noisy pitta, America, no favorite bird because there's no pittas. <laughs> South America, closest I can get, some kind of tapayoa. That's it. <laughs> now, of, of course, the answer is that the best bird or your favorite bird is every bird. No, it's the Binchuk. Binchuk. Needs to win Best Australian Bird of the Year every year. All right? It is worthy of the title. Do you know when I was a kid, I used to go, when, and I was a kid, I don't know, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, can't remember exactly, but I used to go ringing white ibis in a fairly well-known rookery. 
and everybody made fun of me. Why would anyone want to do anything with those stupid birds? And uh, that's amazing. But what I was, cool birds, cool birds. Australian um, magpie, you know, cool bird, murderously violent, but still cool nonetheless. And they don't swoop unless someone's done something to them to make them swoop you. And they remember you. They have a very good memory. Oh, for sure. They can identify. My local magpie doesn't swoop me, but swoops every other bloke. And it was stunned when they first opened their mouths. The sound that comes out of that little face of theirs is remarkable. And that, oh, there we go. And they are a fantastic murder bird. There's no doubt about it. Oh, I love these murder birds so much, yeah. (laughs) All right, um, bucket list bird. What's the bird that you are a list keeper? So what is list bird? The big one before it's gone, Gurney's Pitta. That's the species that's hugely endangered. There used to be a population in Thailand that uh, we're not sure it's, if it's around anymore. I think there might still be a very small number of them left in Thailand, but the main population is in Myanmar and Burma. Uh, and Myanmar, unfortunately, right now, deeply politically unstable, but also the area where they live is under threat of deforestation. Big problems there. And and that's one of my big bucket list birds. Obviously, I've got tons of bucket list birds to, to have to tick off. I'm also starting to shift away from ticking species to ticking families because families, you need to start somewhere. And there are so many families that I, I desperately need and I should have gotten while traveling around that I need to tick off. So on my recent trip to the Netherlands, I finally added great busted to my list. So that's otidity on my list. I finally had bearded tit or bearded reedling. So that's penurity on my list. I need so many families. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is travel to Costa Rica, Puerto Rico to get myself, sorry, Puerto Rico to get myself a toady. And that's one of the families I'm, it's not threatened in particular, but it's such a gorgeous looking bird. And it's something I've always wanted to see for a long time. I reckon that's pretty cool. Let me ask you about the, the pitters in general, about their conservation status. Again, it's off the questions, but something that you mentioned, I'm really interested in what generally the state of the pitters are across the entire range. Broadly speaking, within the genus pitter, so, you know, the colourful ones, not, well, the, the multicoloured ones, they're generally okay, except for the fairy pitter, which is endangered in, uh, or vulnerable, one of those categories. But it's starting to, the fairy pitta's population has been in decline for quite a while, and we're not entirely sure why, because we know that deforestation has largely come to a stop in its breeding territories in places like south of Japan, in Taiwan, and in, in eastern China. We suspect that part of the decline might be due to what's happening in their wintering grounds. And the problem is we don't even know. We know vaguely that they may winter in Borneo, but we don't exactly know where. Other endangered pitters, the other one would be the black-faced pitter in the Solomon Islands, also, you know, habitat loss. It's possible that the black-faced pitter may no longer be around in Bougainville anymore because, well, no one's really been looking and Bougainville's right now not exactly the easiest to get to. Yeah. So those are the two pittas that are under threat. And as we start, you know, finding new pittas spe- or splitting new pitta species, we're going to have to start reckoning also with um, some of these new species potentially already being uh, threatened by the time we identify them as new species. So elegant pittas, which are now three three species, right? The Bandasi pitta, the ornate pitta, and the elegant pitta. They're in the lesser sundas, and we know that deforestation is also starting to happen in the big way in many of these islands. And so we need to start thinking conservation-wise as well. Pitters take to captivity. Is there a chance of establishing <sighs> insurance populations and spreading them around the globe? There are pitters in zoos around the world, but I, from what I can tell, there are no substantial populations of pitters. And captive breeding is only part of the story, as we talked about just now, right? If the habit, oh, the other, the other threatened pitter, endangered pitter is mangrove pitter because mangrove habitats are being wiped out all across East Asia, Southeast Asia, especially. If these birds have no habitat to go back to, then what's the point of keeping them in captivity, right? Breeding them in captivity. You, we still need to think about conservation at the habitat level, at, at the level of the environment that these animals need to survive. So much as I, I, I appreciate the work that zoos are doing for conservation and for education, we also you know, need to have as much a focus, and zoos are also thinking about this as well, about the, the ecosystems that, you know, natural habitats that, that support these organisms. So when it comes to things like mangrove pillar, we need to start appreciating mangroves better. And we, we have started appreciating mangroves better. Following the tsunami on, on Boxing Day, it was 2006, people have started realizing mangroves are an important part of coastal protection. So it's not just about the bird, 
right? The bird is a proxy for a bigger fight that we have to talk about, which is that these habitats not just sustain animals, but they sustain us, right? Yes, we don't go and browse on the spinifex grass in Australia, but they serve an important ecosystem function, right? All these natural landscapes help to regulate temperature, prevent flooding, help to ensure that pest species don't go crazy. And so we need to work this into our common sort of awareness of, of, of nature, common understanding of nature. So, well, and we think that the fairy pillar, we start, we have to realize then it tells, it, it reminds us that conservation is not restricted by political boundaries. It has to be transboundary. It has to be collaborative. It has to be big picture. So to round things off, David, give, I've grown up in, in, in Singapore, obviously been a few places around the world looking at birds and now. Not enough. No, not enough, but you've, you're getting around. And you're now in the southwest of of America. What's your gut feeling about the state of play in conservation? What do you think? Where have we moved in the last 10 years? And is it different in Singapore compared to what you're experiencing in the U.S.? It's uh, That's a very hard question to answer. Conservation has certainly evolved a lot over the years. One thing I appreciate about conservation that's moving toward in the direction it's moving towards is that it's become a lot less colonial, which I'm I'm very happy to see, right? A lot of conservation in the past has been driven by colonial structures. And we're starting to realize that local knowledge and the knowledge of people who live where the birds are has become very instrumental to our understanding of and, and, and protection of the natural world, right? We talk about, for example, in Australia and here in the Southwest as well, fire regimes, the old sort of colonial idea of don't cut anything down, don't let anything burn. We now know it's bad, right? We need to burn, but we need to burn things in a controlled manner to prevent the big fire from happening. And it's okay to cut things down. Just don't cut everything down. Right. Don't cut every bloody tree down. There are sustainable ways of managing the environment. And a lot of this knowledge is not new. A lot of this knowledge has been existing with traditional cultures for a long time. And so we need to start appreciating the fact that the old ways are not... I've always loved the idea, and when I say loved, love, love, (laughs) the, the, the idea that John Gould first described these bird species that he discovered them because somebody shot them in Australia, skinned them, and sent it back to London. I, I think there are a few people in bare, with bare feet who had been wandering the, 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 the pathways for many centuries who knew all about those birds. So, yeah, Absolutely. I take your point about the colonialism and also the knowledge repositories were in the great cities. That's always been it. But it's an ongoing process. Obviously, we, we've not reached the end of the road yet, right? A lot of, again, and, and you brought up this idea about knowledge being concentrated in big cities, and it still is the case, right? A lot of the big museums around the world where I you know, do my research in London, in New York City, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, Leiden in this case, and we need to start thinking about how we can build capacity in the developing world. Right. Because it's not just about people from rich countries and Singapore is a fairly wealthy country. And it's not, we can no longer just parachute in, do all the work, publish it, get all the credit and then piss off. Right. We need to recognize that a lot of these developing countries, there is a lack of capacity, not because they, they, they don't want to do anything. It's because they can't. They don't have the resources. And so there needs to be more parity and more equity as well happening, especially not just in research, but in conservation circles as well, so that the rising tide will lift all boats. And so everyone benefits from conservation, right? You have local interest in, in, in conserving the environment. There are incentives for conserving the environment as well. And it's much more sustainable, really. Well, David, you raised so many issues that I'm, I'm sure we're going to have to talk again to follow some <laughs> of them up. Light pollution, buildings, where we put buildings, l- the spectrums of the light pollution that we have out there. So many things to, to talk about. And of course, I hope that people have learned a little bit about pitters and, have, and will now be getting on Google and putting in 
mangrove pitta and learning about- Never mind mangrove pitta. Just go to your nearest patch for noisy pitta. Take a drive up to Darwin for rainbow pitta. Start local. Get the local pitta. I don't know if you've heard about Bird a Minute, David, but there's this new- the, We're starting this new- I didn't start it, but I jumped on board. Uh, bird a Minute, you go out and you just walk and you see how many birds, and you can only keep progressing as long as you see a new species, Ooh. which means that there you're going to have to get familiar with your local birds to be able to travel further in your local patch, but then you can go to somewhere that a wetland or something and really increase your potential numbers as well as the distance you could travel. But we're going to do a whole... Looking number. forward to that. But you don't need the point being that Get familiar with what's around you. Every bird, whether it's an introduced blackbird or uh, the sparrows or whatever, they're all going to teach you something about birds if you watch them. And then you'll begin to be able to work out which ones are males and females and juveniles and which ones are tree sparrow and which ones are house sparrow. And then you'll learn a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then before you know it, you might be Dr. David Tan. Oh, geez. Far from it. Yeah. When are you expecting to finish the PhD? It's an American PhD. You can go on for years. <laughs> so what, two, uh, 2030, we'll be talking to Dr. Tan. <laughs> 35. <laughs> How can you afford to live in America until I know, 2030, true. pal? Yeah. <laughs> David, thanks. I'm I'm so glad that I, I was researching bird strike in Asia and I, I came up with your name. I, you're famous, David. Eh, no, I'm just, you know, good with putting myself out there. I'm a bit of a whore. That's. <laughs> I'm really interested in the idea of maybe trying to do some educational stuff focused on on Singapore and, and Asia, even while you're over there, because we have the tools to do it. I think Singapore is fine. We have lots of bird watchers, lots of interest. It's really the more underserved parts of Asia that, that needs yeah. a lot of this focus and could benefit from so much more. Yeah, we'll keep in touch about that. Keep an eye out. Uh, to that, David, if someone wants to follow your exploits, have you got some social media that you'd... Just follow me on Twitter or Instagram, I guess. It's very hard to... My, my Twitter handle is very complex, but it's geek speak and leet speak, so it's... Hey, <laughs> hey David. David, th- this is where I go. It'll be in the description below. It'll be in the show notes, yeah, that's right. It, yeah, it'll be in the show notes, exactly. So <laughs> I'll pop that there. Whichever you're happy to share, just sure. let me know. What are you publishing soon? So we've got a paper coming out. My student, my former student now leading the paper on, and this is actually a very exciting story. So he's been brushing my birds looking for parasites. And we find all kinds of things. We find mites. We find lice. We find these hippoboscid flies, or what we call the cat flies. These are flat flies that suck the blood of birds. But we've also been finding these flies with lice attached to them. So these lice, which don't have wings and so don't disperse very well, may be using these flies as taxis to get from one bird to another. And this may actually be a way, a very powerful way of these lice to find new hosts. New new places. Right. And this is actually very cool. We found a louse on a hippoboscid in Singapore on a black nape oriole. Black nape oriole does not make it as far as Australia, but this louse, as far as, oh, yeah, this louse, is only, has only been recorded in Australian birds. It's never been recorded on our side of Wallace's line before. So that's really exciting. These flies might actually be helping these lice to spread. Well, Lacia, the mysteries of Lacia. Oh God, so much to be done. And how much will be unlocked with the advances in genetic analysis of genetics is one thing it's just looking it's observation right the more we observe them but there's still so much to be done so much to be seen that we yeah amazing there we go it's so often we get a, a bit of louse content on the bird emergency if you're looking for lice this is one of the places to come <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks so much it's been illuminating i've learned so much hopefully everybody who's listening and watching has done the same I'm Grant Williams. This has been The Bird Emergency. Thanks again. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.